Starting. Terrible. That's why I had my camera. All right, let me uh, start. The, okay, first I want to screen share. I have only used Zoom. Amazingly, uh, I've only actually used it maybe a half dozen times since uh, all this started. So I'm actually really bad with it. Okay, do you see the a white page yes. with some text on it? Yes, full screen, okay. looks good. Okay, so the, the first thing I'd just like to say is that I've been absolutely wowed by the past few presentations and it it uh it does it is very humbling and um I I I just also like to say I'm not I'm not an engineer I'm a 17 year old community college graduate and I want to study communications astronomy outreach is more my thing uh, I wish I could draw like Mel because I, I love doing deep sky observing but really deep sky observing and astronomy outreach are kind of my thing so that's really what my scopes are built for and that's what I try to further with my work so give it in that um, the best telescope to me is one that people get to look through so. Um, I, I really emphasize portability and convenience. And uh, here are some scopes I've owned. Uh, there's a Coulter red tube that's sitting in my shed I'm about to give away. There's a tricolor C8 on the right and there's a 60 millimeter refractor I gave to somebody I'm very close friends with um, in the middle. Um, and the best telescope though is also something that's preferably as, as large as possible for a couple of reasons. Obviously aperture, the views are better, uh, but people are just more impressed by a big telescope because it's big and it doesn't resemble the junk they got for Christmas when they were a kid. Um, so with that all in mind, um, I, I've been interested in large telescopes since I really got started in astronomy. And I remember there used to be a time when I thought an eight inch was absolutely huge because uh, I started with a four inch Mac and then I made a six inch. And uh, I, the thing I've really learned is that the, the best way to learn to make stuff, at least for me, is to build things over and over again and hope they work and if they don't start over and modify them endlessly, which I like to compare to what SpaceX is currently doing down in Texas with their Starship, where they have managed to build a lot of steel tubes and fill them with cryogenic propellants and uh, liquid nitrogen and blow them up a lot of times. And last week they finally stacked SN8, which seems to be the first full Starship that might actually make it above the ground without exploding and with three engines and have wings. Um, and with that in mind, I think that the optical telescope design is never truly achieved because you're always learning new things just from actually using it. And to me, the, the learning from actually using it part is really important. So what I try to do is I try to build the minimum viable product that you can actually go out and test the basics of operation and then improve on it. Because you learn, even if the, the overall quality of what you've built is really low, there are a lot of things you can learn just from using that that are really important to the final design that might not necessarily occur to you on paper. Um, so the first thing I did when I started hearing about sub F4 telescopes and I, I started reading Mel's website and I came to the Altaz workshop last year, uh, and I talked about this scope a little, was I wanted to build a 10 inch F3 because you know, I wanted to answer these questions. Could I, a mere mortal who does not have decades of experience in building and using telescopes, use an F3 and find it beneficial? And furthermore, could somebody with average mirror making skills uh, make uh, make an F3, which was my friend Logan. I, we've since fallen out of touch, but I had him make the mirror for this. And so I came up with, okay, I'm gonna do 10 F3, nice size, because it's enough that you can just do some serious observing with it, but it's not big enough that it's a, Mac, a large investment. I didn't even have to build a mount. I just stuck it in a tube and put it on a CG5. Um, and this was really good. Uh, the views were really nice. Uh, the unfortunate thing was that I found myself with a bit of an issue in that it's a bit longer than Mel's 10 incher, so it's really not a good tabletop telescope, but it's also not really good on equatorial or, a, or on a full-size dob mount. And I, I, I uh, got rid of it because I, I couldn't find a mount that made sense for it where I would actually use it and not have some sort of encumberment of a table or awkward pedestal legs or rotating it on an equatorial. So after the success of the 10, which I only used for, I only actually used for a handful of months, I feel kind of bad. Uh, I said, okay, I'm gonna go bigger. So I had a lot of different ideas. And so ranging from a 14 incher to an 18 incher. So I thought, you know, what if I do a meniscus uh, with 0 0.75 inch plate glass from Logan and Logan tried to make a 16 inch meniscus and that didn't go very well. So that was out. And then I said, okay, what if I do just like an F3.5? But the thing I found with that was that the field of view was getting kind of small and the scope itself was getting kind of big. And I didn't really like the idea of a full of a real thick Pyrex mirror. 
So I talked to the Steve Dodds at Nova, and he happened to have one of these, one of the last few of these 14.7 inch semiconductor blanks, which there was this company that was using them for some sort of semiconductor thing. They get worn out and they have to be replaced. And so there were just piles of these things. And Steve and a couple other guys bought like hundreds of them and made them into mirrors. And they're 0 0.8 inches thick and they're made out of solid fused silica. So um, they have a number of advantages over a glass mirror. Of course, there's CTE, but they're actually, uh, I, I did some research and Quartz actually has a higher um, modulus of strength that, or something like that. I'm, I'm than a regular Pyrex. So uh, I got away with a weaker mirror cell than I could have otherwise. Um, and it's the first of my scopes that actually didn't come in massively over budget or massively late, which was nice. Um, and it exceeded my, it's really exceeded my expectations. So uh, with regards to the field of view, which I'm sure everybody here is familiar with RFTs, but I just thought it would be fun to show because I have an observatory near me with a C14 uh, and the maximum field of view of the C14 is 138% smaller than the, uh, well, sorry, no, the 14 has a, my 14.7 has a 138% larger area than the C14 in the observatory. And I get about 70% more area than the, some of the people with 14 inch Dobbs who I've met with that are usually F4, F5, and they, they're using a 31 Nagler or 41 Panoptic to get the widest field. And I like the, I, I really like the ethos and the 100 degree eyepieces because in addition to the fact that you really are able to game these uh, laws of physics and whatnot to get the most field of view out of an exit people, the, uh, the immersion factor is just amazing combined with that super wide true field of view. And that's really what I've been trying to get with this scope. And I think I've really succeeded. So I, again, I build by trial and error because I'm not very good at math and I'm not very good at uh, project management. So originally I was going to actually build it out of maple and aluminum and make it really minimalist. I was going to have like an A-frame tube and I was going to have a maple mirror box. And uh, I gave up on that after trying to glue up maple panels and finding I had about a 50% success rate at that. And the issue is when you're trying to make a mirror box out of maple, you're going through about 50, 50 to $70 worth of maple for every one of those. So if you mess up 50% of that box, that's 25 to 35 bucks worth of material that you're throwing out. And I just didn't find it worth it. And then I wanted to do one at a half, a mirror box at a half inch plywood where the upper tube assembly nested in it. But the problem was there that I just felt that the box had a tendency to want to force itself into a parallelogram. And if I was going to brace it so it wouldn't do that, it was just going to weigh as much as a three quarter inch. And I like three quarter inch plywood because I can use biscuits on it and I can, I don't have to worry about screws poking through the other side if I put handles. And then I thought, oh, I'm going to put it in a concrete form tube. So I actually went and bought concrete form tubes and I'm all ready to go. And then I actually tried to put them in the car and I, was, I, I just didn't like the idea, uh, mostly because I couldn't see when I backed out of my driveway with the tube in the back. So then uh, after a lot of work, um, I bought the mirror in November. I had it in hand by Christmas and uh, I kept messing around for most of the winter. Uh, I finally came up with this horrifying looking thing that vaguely resembles a daub uh, because what I did was I remembered I had a 12 inch daub that I had built. Uh, I had kept most of the structure. So I said, okay, let's just shove the optics in that. Uh, I stole the bearings, the mirror box, parts of the rocker, the truss poles, the truss connectors. Uh, I think even the ring there for the upper tube assembly is stolen from the 12. And I used a drum shell for the upper tube assembly, which I really like, but this thing was terrible because I silicone the mirror to its cell. Uh, it was really heavy. It didn't balance. The barriers were too small and I really hated it. So uh, I used that for like a month or so though, because I wanted to get an idea of just observing a low power with the scope, even though the mirror being glued to the cell had something like two ways of astigmatism. So you basically couldn't use anything more than a 17 millimeter ethos on it, which was really bad. Um, but I, I, I used it a lot and I kept writing down all the issues I was having with it and the things I didn't like. And I, I spent a lot of time looking at people's scope builds online. I, I was really bored. Uh, they hadn't really moved any of the classes to Zoom at my community college I was at, and uh, I didn't really have anything else to do. So um, I was observing with this thing nightly just to, just to see what was wrong with it, more or less. And after a lot of work, uh, about two, two and a half months, I came up with this thing. Uh, so I call this the Mark 10. You'll notice the version numbering here. Uh, the mark revisions are basically any major change that I think makes the telescope no longer really resemble its previous version in the field. So I came up with these giant altitude bearings, which were cut by a guy uh, with a CNC in Long Island. Uh, 
I stole the design from New Moon uh, for those. And um, they're actually, tw I think they're 26 or 28 inches. They're, they're really huge. And I sort of went with Mel's folding daub design, except I didn't make it fold. But the idea was I wanted to keep the whole mirror box assembly low and uh, keep, and uh, I really didn't want the center of mass to shift too much. And uh, I made uh, my own upper truss brackets, which are terrible looking, but work really well. And uh, I put a curved spider in. I didn't have that originally. Um, and the scope went down to 48 pounds. Uh, There's still a lot of issues though. And one of them was the mirror cell. I had it siliconed. Then I actually had the mirror uh, on tabs of Velcro uh, to hold it to the support points. And then I just had it sitting on these edge supports that were really designed to help you center the mirror, not to actually hold it in place. So um, this mirror cell is weird because I was uncomfortable with the idea of making one. So I just bought one from Aurora Precision. Aurora Precision AZ mirror cells are not made for thin mirrors. Also, they don't really recommend that you buy the 14.5, even though they offer it. Uh, and the interesting thing was, I was able to make this work. I talked to the guy, Nathan at Aurora, and he came up with these little mini roller bearings that are made out of Delrin. Uh, they, keep the, they keep the mirror centered and it's able to spin around in the cell. And it only has about the one tenth of a wave of astigmatism. And that's because the, the edge support points are not positioned at quite the exact degree angle they should be. But, you know, considering that it's a cell that wasn't designed for this, I, I'm pretty happy with it. And it's a one-tenth of a wave of astigmatism. I really don't care. And the other interesting thing, going back to the quartz, is that um, because the quartz has a higher modulus of stiffness, the uh, plop gave me, um, I think it gave me about 1 20th wave error with six points. And it practices probably slightly worse than that. But uh, there's no print through with six points. There's no trefoil issues. There's nothing that would indicate that only having six points of support is a problem. And uh, oh, it looks like I lost the photo of the edge supports or something. Uh, I'll just pull that up real fast. Actually, no. I, oh, it's there. It's right there. I don't know why it doesn't show in the slideshow. Whoops. Let's go back to there. Uh, yeah, I don't know why it doesn't show up. Um, so then I, I did a lot more revisions. Uh, so here's just the sort of list of them. So I put them in my focuser on there because I had a helical crayfruit from Kinetoptics. Optics. I love those focusers. They do not work at f2.9, um, especially at high magnification. I put magnets on the upper tube assembly to so I could transport the whole scope compacted in as few trips as possible. There's an EQ platform under it, which I know is kind of cheating, but I didn't really feel like doing a whole drive system on something this small, actually. Uh, I cut down the mirror box, I mean, the rocker box and redid it. Uh, I put a lot of baffles. There's a baffle behind the primary mirror. Um, and the scope, even with the platform, is now 51 pounds. So it gained three pounds in tracking. And it's actually more compact now than the Mark 10, which I find pretty cool. Um, and uh, it actually fits in a passenger seat if you stack it right, which is, which is pretty cool. I haven't, I haven't driven with it like that because I don't really want to, but it, it can. Uh, I was actually contemplating shoving this in a in a box and shipping it to the Texas Star Party or OSP before those got canceled. Um, and I actually really just finished all these upgrades uh, this month. The, the baffling and the EQ platform are really recent, but I'm really liking it so far. And obviously now the question is, well, what have I seen with it with amidst all these upgrades and all that? And I could tell you that it more or less does everything you would expect a good 14 incher to do. Um, but there's also been some stuff that's surprising. So I saw Galileo Regio. I've seen Galileo Regio on Ganymede, which is uh, I've seen it with uh, I've seen it with other scopes. Um, I've seen it better with a with the 16 that I had. But you can see it. Uh, the thing people don't realize is that Galileo Regio takes up like a third of the entire face of an entire hemisphere, or close to half. So it actually is pretty easy to see. You can tell that the top or bottom half is darker than the other. Uh, the NK division and sound its rings. But the first thing that I, I really went deep on with this was the heart and soul nebula, which I don't think Mel has a sketch of this. And my rule was, if Mel doesn't have a sketch of it, I must not be able to see it with this. So I went for the heart and soul nebula anyway, because I, I, I was talking to one of my friends and she had just done a photo of it. I was like, oh, I'm going to try that visually. And um, you can actually see the heart structure. I, I can't draw. I really wish I could. But it's really cool. You, you can see it. It's very dim. It's like an integrated flux nebula, but you can see it. Uh, Pickering's triangle in the veil, G1 and G2 in Andromeda. That was cool because 
I went for G1 and I, I saw that G2 was there on the charts and G2 is barely visible, but it's there. Um, individual H2 regions in a lot of the spiral galaxies. Um, another interesting thing that I found was um, you could start to see color in globular clusters. This one, I really didn't know if I was imagining. So I actually, uh, I, was with, I was with some folks um, observing and I, 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 asked, I asked some of my friends to take a look. Uh, and they all saw this kind of warmish tone. It's not really color. I feel like that's the wrong word. You can't, you can't tell, except in M4, M4 has some red stars. But when you look at M13 with a scope this size, it's doing something to activate your cones, but not a lot. Uh, so you can kind of tell there's this warmish tone to it, but I can't tell if it's yellow or orangey or what, and obviously the stars themselves are different colors, uh, but it is a warmish tone. Uh, the North America and Pelican Nebula look really cool. Um, and I've seen the Cal, I just saw the California Nebula for the first time with it, uh, like last week. Uh, and I have been starting to hunt for the integrated flux nebulae that Mel loves to draw, uh, including the one near uh, M31. And I think I've seen a bit around M13 and the uh, central star in M57. Um, I'm not really that good of an observer. Uh, I like to use Sky Safari on my phone as a chart. So I'm probably blowing away a good chunk of my dark adaptation on a regular basis. Uh, I have um, mediocre skies. Of, that's the other thing. Um, my skies are barely Bortle 3. They're technically Bortle 4 on the map. I've measured Bortle, that they're probably something like Bortle 3. Uh, and I drive 90 minutes up to Litchfield, Connecticut for that. Uh, my house is Bortle 6. It's terrible. Um, and I guess, the, I guess the thing to me that's really cool is not that you're seeing this all with a 14 inch, it's that you're seeing this all with a scope that weighs 51 pounds and you can set up in a couple minutes and tracks and uh, you know you can get a 1.7 degree field out of. And it can, you know, it can really pull these faint objects and do these high resolution things and do wide field stuff. And I really, I didn't really plan to make it all in one telescope, but I sort of ended up doing that. Obviously collimating it well enough to do these high resolution things takes a while. If I'm just doing deep sky, I won't, and the seeing's not very good. I won't spend as much time collimating, but um, uh, that that's a challenge. Uh, I wish I could explain how it works, but I, I honestly, I barely understand how to collimate the thing myself. Uh, and I would have to, it's a weird, it's a weird process. Um, so obviously I've not even gotten close to uh, exceeding the limits of, of what this scope is capable of. There's, there's a lot more things I'm still looking at with it and a lot of things I'm trying to do. Uh, I, I've split some sub arcs that can double stars with it, uh, which has been interesting. Uh, but the thing, I, I am really hoping to look at more integrated flux nebulae, but I'll admit that my favorite thing to look at is galaxies. And, you know, I think uh, the guy, the guy that was being talked about last night, Jimmy, he likes to use a uh, a 36 and a the 48, you know, galaxies, you can always have more aperture. Who cares about field of view? So with that in mind, I started coming up with a larger scope. And uh, initially I wanted to do it. I was actually going to do a 17 and a half inch daub out of a Coulter mirror just for galaxies. I didn't really care about anything else. Uh, and then I got, I, I decided that wasn't enough of an upgrade to, to um, waste my time and money on. And uh, then I then I said, okay, how about a 20 or 22? And I, I did all the math and I found that the gain of one of those over a 14 is really not a lot, especially because I think the 14 has enhanced coatings. So I, I really couldn't come up with an economic justification for that. And then I, uh, I talked to Nova about a 24 inch F3.5 and it came in about 5,000 bucks, which was pretty cheap, but um, not, not affordable for me. I, I, uh, I pay for all this stuff by writing telescope reviews, pretty much. That's how I, how I do this. Um, no money from, from, uh, family or anything to, to finance. This is all me. Um, and the um, the thing was that, you know, I, I could have probably bought the mirror, but I didn't want to buy a mirror and then throw together a structure out of junk. So then I got a, I got an email about how uh, it had, he had made this 24 F 3.5 and uh, it gotten damaged in shipping by UPS. And I'll show you a picture of that in a minute. And I got a very hefty discount on the mirror. So I said, okay, how about I build a 24 inch? Um, and uh, the, the funny thing with this is that it has to fit in my mom's Ford C-Max hatchback, which I don't know how many people here are familiar with Ford C-Max, but it's not a big car. I don't have a big Ford Transit like I think Howard has. I would love one of those, but um, I don't. 
And so I, I've, I've been faced with this monumental problem of how to fit a 24 inch or a hatchback because I, I really don't want this, this one, especially the 14, I'm good with just being for me. But part of the reason I added tracking to the 14 was just for, for astronomy outreach once there's more of that to be done again. But this one to me, I really wanted a, a scope that I could that I could get out in a moment's notice and have set up fast and wasn't something I was restricted to using a couple times a month or with a multi-person setup or in my yard. So uh, I've been spending a lot of time trying to figure out how to get this in a hatchback. And there are some weird compromises like the uh, altitude bearings uh, have a cutoff at the top. You'll see it, there's a render of them in a second um, that they, they, they uh, have 15 degrees cutoff because that saves me about three inches of clearance. And uh, that means I can't point right at the horizon anymore, but who wants to do that? Um, and uh, I also welded the mirror cell on this, which was terrifying. Uh, so here's, here's some, more, uh, some more pictures of it. So on the upper left here is the primary. As I got it, I was a little afraid that they were gonna completely destroy it, uh, shipping it to me from Nova, but they didn't. And uh, here's a dual pass auto collimation image of the primary. It has a little turn down edge that needs to be masked down, but. Uh, considering the price I paid, I, I don't really care if it becomes a 23 and a half. And um, that, uh, that chip looks terrible, but it didn't affect the figure at all because it's, uh, it's a clean, it came right off the side, which is interesting. I, I did a lot of reading on glass fracturing after this happened. And um, it, there's no stress or anything in the mirror itself. So there's no, I'm not worried about anything long-term. And um, the, on oh, the upper right here is my mirror cell. Now I started working on this in May and at the time I, I really didn't have a lot of help with uh, with the welding. I had one of my dad's friends come over and show me the, the basics. And then I, I threw this together, the tailgate of it and uh, use a cable sling, which I, I would have preferred 90 degree edge supports but the edge support calculations were a lot harder for me to do. So I just went with the sling because I can mess with the sling to my heart's content um, very easily. And those are the, so, some support points on the bottom right. And on the left here, you can see the uh, weird little uh, cutoff on the bearings. And you can see it actually removes quite a lot of uh, material, which, which really helps with fitting it. And uh, in the middle here, there's the field of view comparison, which I, I always think is interesting. Because we, you know when you're using scopes, typically you're thinking in terms of magnification. And, uh, you know, or, or, and you know, Mel's got this idea of thinking about a tendu. And the thing I, I think, I like to think about mostly is just, area you know even if you have even if you say oh it's only double the, the magnification double the focal length the uh the interesting thing is that's actually one quarter of the area of the 14 inch which means that if i am doing my usual dead reckoning of finding deep sky objects with a tell rad it's about i have about one quarter of the likelihood of that my target's actually going to be in the field of view when i point it which is a funny thing to think about and um i'm i'm again uh i'm in the final stages of this scope really uh the sides of the rocker box aren't in this photo because I uh, cut them to the wrong size and had to re have to redo them. And the only other things that have to be done are uh, the, fo the focuser board here. Uh, I might trim these struts down. I'm waiting for a new spider. The old one was was uh, not heavy duty enough for the secondary, and um, I have to make I have to put the support points in and put the mirror in, and then I'll, and build the the wheelbarrow handles, move the scope around, and I'm all done. And. Uh, I, I guess um, I guess to me the, I'm I'm a little bummed that I, I didn't I didn't have the ability to make this an F3 or an F2.8 or something. I, I really wish it was because then I could really avoid the ladder or the step stool rather for me. Um, but I'm pretty happy with with how it, how it's going. I think it's going to be good. I hope it's good. Um, I'm a little concerned about that. And. Uh, I, I, I guess I, I, uh, I was a little afraid to experiment as much with the fort as I did with the 14, because with the 14, everything is so, sm is, I mean, it's a, it's a big scope, but everything is small and you can, you know, you ever, everything can be picked up with one hand and you can put all the parts of it on one table and taking it apart takes five minutes and it's nothing's the size of a person. This, this I didn't want to mess around with uh, as much because tearing it down and redoing it is kind of a trickier proposition. So the whole, the whole uh, build, destroy, repeat thing is a little, a little more intimidating. And uh, I, I, I guess I, I hope that I hope that if anybody is inspired by this, that they're a little more courageous than me when it comes to that. Because I feel like I'm probably going to end up regretting that I didn't, uh, I didn't get more experimentative with the the design here. Um.
but I, I'm looking forward to it. And I think there are probably going to be more upgrades to the 14. I've already come up with a few. Uh, I'd like to do a, um, I'd like to have some sort of um, iris on the, on the focuser for, uh, for, for uh, baffling purposes. And, and I could actually stop down the aperture and uh, I need to make an off axis mask for it too. Um, that's, that's about all I have. Uh, so if there, if the, I, I just wanted to thank everybody for, for inviting me to this. And if, if there's any questions, I see that there are a couple in the chat here. So let me just read those homemade mirror. cell. yes, I, I did uh, weld that I've actually, this was the first thing I ever welded other than, well, I, I bought uh, some extra square steel tubing and welded that, welded that together first. Um, it's with a stick welder. Uh, and, uh, it, uh, I'll admit it's not the prettiest, um, but it is pretty strong. Uh, I, I, I did put threaded inserts um, on as well. So, so there's a mechanical connection too, as a backup as a, and a fail safe, but the welds are pretty strong. I, uh, I was able to put the mirror, I put the mirror cell in a, in like a vice basically, and then stood on the end of it and it, you know, it, nothing happened. So that's more, I weigh more than the mirror does. So if, if it's going to break, it's going to be for me, not the mirror. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I did use plop. Um, the, uh, it's an 18 point, uh, those triangles that you saw there are not actually the ones I'm using. I, I decided those were too thin and I'm using quarter inch aluminum for the plates. Uh, the, um, the, some of the cell dimensions I did just steal from, uh, from the Dobsonian telescope because I was lazy and I couldn't figure out some of the, I couldn't figure out the tailgate bar. So I ended up using using just some addition and subtraction to figure out the, the placement of the tailgate bars because plop doesn't really tell you that uh, because it's not designed to. Plop is confusing. I, I don't fully I still don't fully understand it. So Zane, um, yeah. you, you seem to go through telescopes as fast as most people go through um, oh heck, I don't know what uh, a pair of shoes. So yeah, I've are owned you, 180. Are, actually, my yeah. 180th my 180th telescope was today. I got oh, an ETX one. I got an ETX 125 that uh, I I um uh, I got it very cheap because I was told the motors don't work. The motors do work. I'm not sure what's wrong with them though because the so the battery connection just broke and uh, so I've been powering it off of DC and the scope just randomly decides to slew itself in RA for no reason. Uh, I've been trying to figure that out. Um, but yeah, I, I go through a lot of scopes and that's part of why, how I learn about designing them is just sure, by tearing them sure. down. And so, so my question them. is, are you planning on keeping your 14.7 inch? Oh scope? yes, yes. The, the idea with the 14 was I wanted to build and the 24 too, but the, the 14 inch definitely for me was I wanted to build a scope that I didn't ever want to get rid of uh, or scrap. Uh, because back when I started on the 14, I was still considering a lot of different things for college. So I was like, well, I want this scope to fit under a bed in a dorm. Uh, I want this scope to fit, you know, if I have to fit it in a passenger seat, then then it should. I want to be able to put it on a cart and wheel it down an elevator if I'm in a dorm. Now those aren't problems because I'm doing, I'm uh, going to a local school. But at the time that was very concerning. And, you know, regardless of my living situation, I want to be able to use that scope. And I, I, I've been improving it like crazy because if there's ever a day when I don't have access to a shop anymore, I don't want to be sitting there going, oh, this, this thing really frustrates me. I want something different. Well, good. It looks like it's a, it's a really a good scope, and uh, yeah, certainly from your observing reports. And I, I'm glad you like it enough to think you're going to keep it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's that is a that is a rare thing for me. Yeah. Well, and then like you said in your in your presentation earlier, no scope is ever really finished. Yeah. So no. You'll, definitely. You'll, you'll keep tinkering. I will with be it. modifying it forever. Uh, oh yeah. I will probably be modifying it when I'm like seventy. I'm sure. <laughs> I, I don't think there might not be any original components at that point. It might be the ship of Theseus, but I will still be modifying it. I, I can well imagine how that goes. I, uh, yeah, I have a telescope that's gone through that type of uh, metamorphosis, metamorphosis since I was 14. So yeah, I get it. So um, any other questions out there or is it time for a short break? Okay, let's let's take a, a two-minute break. Actually, right, there are you. a few questions on, on the chat that Dan and I asked. 
Oh, uh, there are more? I, hold on, let me. Oh, oh okay, yes. Yeah, so oh, yeah, so I am I going to be a professional astronomer? Uh, no, I actually, for me, like all this is really kind of a side thing. I, I really enjoy bringing astronomy stuff to the public, actually. I don't know, how do I mess with, with the screen share here? I, I have no idea. Um, let me just go to, uh, let me just show you guys something. Uh, where do I, oh, I don't know. Oh, no, wrong one. Uh, screen, no, nope, new share. Uh, I'm gonna just do the whole screen here. There we go. Um, one of the big things for me with this 14 inch actually is that uh, I have one, I don't know if you can see this here. Can you see um, Google Chrome and Reddit? Yeah. Uh, I am the top slash r slash space post of all time and actually one of the top reddit posts of all time with this scope and I look like an idiot in it so this is going to be me till the end of time uh this photo I look terrible I'm not wearing shoes the ground board's not painted and it's the ugliest version of the scope um but what I loved about this besides getting my 15 minutes of fame was that there were I had so many people messaging me about how they could build their own scope or where to get a scope. Uh, I, I was answering, I was replying to people like who were seriously interested in building their own scope or, or obtaining one. But a lot of people interested in building for a month. I had people message, I had to, a month long backlog of messages about building a scope. And there have actually been a few people since I posted this who built Dobsonians directly as a result of this um which i'm really proud of and to me that's the real fun of this i i can take the 14 out to observe with or i'm take it out with my friends to to look through and show them the views all i want you know i i've done that quite a bit here but to me this right here is infinitely more valuable than any of that because this is not it's not just inspiring people to make telescopes and not, it's not just inspiring people to do astronomy. It's showing people that, you know, you can, I think that this workshop does that too. It's showing people that you don't have to be a guy in a university necessarily. You don't have to be this professional. You don't have to be on TV to do really amazing stuff. You don't have to be a trained professional to build something. You don't have to, you know, you don't have to, spend thousands of dollars to have a good telescope you don't have to and you can make something cool or do something cool with almost nothing if you have the inspiration and make the effort and that to me is the really valuable thing about about building these and about doing astronomy everything like and i think there's also a lot of skills to be learned here too about project about not just engineering but i i think i've learned and this is something that's really helped me is i've learned a lot about project management budgeting and all of that stuff from building these scopes. I've learned little skills that I might not, that, you know, I've learned well, I learned how to weld from making the mirror. So I could have cheaped out and just gone and bought one. I it would have cost me more, but I learned how to weld. I know how to weld now. Uh, I think that it, that, that one of the great things about, about telescope making in is it's very interdisciplinary sort of uh, part of the hobby because you're learning all of these different skills at once. You're learning about you're learning about everything from project management to to um, all these to different types of mathematics to optical testing to you know aesthetics to um, you know to um, just to you know just getting the word out there about this stuff and trying to spread your ideas. I think all of that is really important. And I think that it's I think that this that these ideas of doing stuff yourself and project management and learning how to learning how to share information about a project are things that I think t in today's world are, are kind of lacking. And I think, I think it's great to be able to, to give people an interesting way to, to, to get into these ideas and learn these skills that I think are really important for everybody to know. And that's really what this is about. It's not, it's to me, it's much more than the telescopes of the stuff you're looking at, or even that it's astronomy. That's a great answer. Uh, that is really a great answer. Uh, thank you very much for that.